order the Planning Commission meeting regular session for Thursday, April 17th at 12 o'clock. Actually, it's 12.05. Uh, um, present are all five members of the Planning Commission and the Law Director, Mr. Lang. Uh, anybody who is expecting to speak, please stand up and uh, do you swear or affirm that what you say will be the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. Um, the first thing I wanted to do um, before we get started uh, is to uh, adopt the bylaws which we've been working on with the Planning, with the planning Commission members. Um, we probably have bylaws someplace, but nobody can find them. So uh, these are our new bylaws, and they fit on one sheet, which is handy. Um, they establish that Robert's Rules of Order will be the procedure that we'll follow, which is what we've been following. And uh, that three members constitute a quorum, the commission will elect a chair and a vice chair from among the appointed members for two-year terms. If a quorum is present, motions are deemed passed if approved by a majority of those voting. Um, to be on the agenda, a case must have all paperwork complete in the office of the mayor by noon on Thursday, a week before the scheduled meeting. And the rest of it is uh, pretty routine. Does anybody have any uh, questions or anything? Would anybody like to move to adopt them? Uh, I move we adopt the bylaws. I'll second it. Madam, Madam Chair, if I might, just yes. because I know there had been a question about this, uh, and I'd spoken to you um, in my office that uh, state law actually provides that uh, the Planning Commission, you know, specifically has authority to, to adopt those bylaws. And so I guess I, I was a little surprised, as I think some others were as well, that uh, we didn't already have them. But uh, in, in the absence of, uh, of bylaws, I think this is a, is a pretty, uh, pretty smart thing to be doing. Thank you. Um, any discussion questions? Um, I think one of the, the questions I would have, of course, is um, it does not really address the, um, I think last time there was an abstention. I, I know at council you can't abstain unless there's a conflict, uh, but that, uh, that can be addressed at a later time as we tweak the bylaws or whatever happens in the future. But Well, it does address that because it says a majority of those voting. Okay, and the circumstance so, of voting. So, and if the person is, is abstaining, mm -hmm. they're not considered to be voting. Okay. Right. It just doesn't address the issues about why you would abstain. Yes. So, that right now it would be read as you abstain for whatever personal reason that you would abstain. <laughs> Right. That's correct, and this, this gets back to that question which I know was raised earlier regarding a two-to-one vote and whether that constituted passage, and uh, as I, had, I know I had explained to, uh, to or had sent in an email uh, to, uh, to Steve Pearson, and as I spoke with you in, in my office, that uh, does constitute passage uh, in the absence of any uh, rules to the contrary on that. And that is, was also consistent with a, a law director's opinion which had been issued a couple of years ago regarding that same situation on council. And so if somebody is, is, is not, not a voting member, then that doesn't count toward, uh, toward whether or not a majority is going to Okay. There's uh, one other uh, question that I wanted to ask you to make clear, and that is, am I correct that you can't insist that somebody explain why they're abstaining, that there's, you cannot force somebody to vote? Again, in the absence of a rule to the contrary, yes, that's correct. Okay. If they want to, well, that's fine. Okay, uh, any other discussion? Okay, I'd like to vote. All those in favor of adopting the bylaws? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. Melissa? <laughs> okay, let's move to the cases. 0601, Dave Hoisington, Tyler Ridge, uh, Major Subdivision. Steve, would you like to explain what we're doing? My name is Steve Pearson. I'm a zoning administrator for the city of Adams, Ohio, and I have been sworn in. Um, Mr. Hoisington, um, who has a proposed subdivision within three miles of town outside the corporation limits, but within the planning jurisdiction of the city, uh, proposes a subdivision called Tyler Ridge. 
um, the number of lots has changed along the way basically because of uh, consideration for private sewage disposal systems um, and that is reviewed um, and approved by the county health department county health department my understanding is that they review all private sewage disposal systems for one two and three family dwellings these are all proposed to be single family dwellings um, originally there was a preliminary approval um, might have been in 06 maybe as far back as 05 uh, at the end of last year um, Mr. Hoisington came back and asked for an extension of time because the two years allowed for that preliminary approval had expired. Um, I believe, Ms. Cohn, you made a motion to reapprove a new preliminary approval, but then Mr. Hoisington would have to come back then for final approval, um, which would include payment of new preliminary and final review fees, um, or application fees, excuse me. So. As I recall, Mr. Hoisington just asked me where this was at process, what he needed to do, and, and could he come in and uh, you know, kind of explain the situation, where is, he, where is he at, what does he need, what needs to be provided. Because even from way back when, I think you can recall, these things where subdivisions are outside the city and probably annexation is not imminent. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the Planning Commission, the City of Athens, is reviewing a project that's going to be then overseen by township trustees, county commissioners, um, you know, county road crews, township road crews, um, volunteer fire departments, county sheriff. Um, and so, traditionally, the Planning Commission has looked for input from those public officials that will uh, provide service to those areas. Um, in any case, uh, it's always the county health department for sewage disposal. Um, so there were those, you know, those kinds of questions. Not necessarily having to go through a complete, uh, full-blown, you know, like you were in the city kind of thing with uh, five-foot sidewalks, curb and gutter, uh, possibly stormwater detention, those kinds of things. So this has been ongoing over uh, quite a few months, actually several years. Um, and so Mr. Hoisington is at the point now where he would like to have a plat approved um, so it can be recorded and lots can be sold. I and forwarded the, quite a bit of information to about the request to Bob Eichenberg, the county planner, and to Chuck Hammer, um, uh, director of the health department. So. And the preliminary, the extension of the preliminary approval has expired now? Or no. Is it still, it's still, it's still good? No. Okay. Yeah, you, you have up to two years. No, excuse me. It's either one or two. I forget. It might be two. Um, that part of the code I don't have memorized. But at any rate. But at any rate, the new preliminary approval is still in effect. Okay. Yeah. It, it's not been any more than just a few months um, since that okay. occurred. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other? <laughs> Would you like to come up, Doctor? Yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Hoisington, um, and I'm trying to get this little project finished up here. Um, this is kind of an update. Um, an outgoing update and an incoming uh, question as to what I need to do to finish this. Um, what I've provided there is what's done. The road is mostly there. Leax Water and AEP are, are committed. Um, Nelsonville Cable, which is not a priority or not a requirement, but they are <coughs> available. Um, Mr. Hammer and Mr. Pearson are discussing, um, as far as to the best of my knowledge, uh, how and where I believe Mr. Hammer wants somewhere stated um, either on the legal descriptions or on the plat or somewhere that there will be actual notice to to buyers of the laws that they have to get their septic approved for their individual lot even though I've got them generally approved for a septic system at this point um, uh, the ODOT permit um, for the road bore which is to bring LEAX under the road and for basically just entering State Route 682 from my road is um, is reapplied for. I had it once, and it expired due to the length of time. This is unfortunately taken. Um, 
I have a contractor uh, working on some stuff now, and he's going to get with the engineer and finish up the specs. He's giving me estimates on actually finishing the road, which is basically just putting stone down at this point and, and did improving the ditches. And then I've got um, you know some things that we'll do when the road is being finished. Uh, I have the the Mylar plat map, the final plat with the signature lines for everybody. I've not had anybody sign it yet because I'm still waiting for everybody to say it's not that people sign that. Um, questions? I guess that's an update as far as what I've done. Will you be asking the uh, township trustees to accept the road when you finish it? I, that's the way I understand it. And I've talked to the township trustees a couple of times. Okay. They've been up there. I talked to Dick Shaw. Um, verbally, they had no problem with it, but they haven't signed anything yet. Steve, have we, in the past, have we gotten a, uh, just a letter from the township trustees, or we don't have a form, do we, for having them sign off? No, not necessarily. <clears throat> Generally what happens is for the roads, um, that's under the purview of the county engineer. Um, he accepts the roads initially, and then if there'll be a county road, he keeps them, maintains them. If not, uh, if it becomes a township road, then the county engineer gives over to the, uh, to the trustees. Um, part of the consideration for the road improvements is the uh, yeah, do you want to come up to the mic or come to a mic? <laughs> well, you can at the table would we'll do just as well. Yeah. I'll stay up here. Okay. Um, you know, there are some uh, requirements for providing uh, engineered documents on how the road will be constructed, the type of road, the type of surface, um, the slope, the curves, um, those kinds of things, which I believe Mr. Eichenberg has uh, reviewed some drawings on that. Um, in addition, there's bonding that's required. I believe in the county it's 100% of the cost, an engineer's estimate of cost to install the road. And I also believe that on the county level, they want a 100% bond, uh, maintenance bond for two years. Uh, and that's just in case any road failure occurs. That happens after the road is initially accepted for its original installation. So, so we don't these, these are uh, these are so. county standards. Uh, the city standard, I believe, is uh, it's a reduced amount for I believe just a year. Uh, but on the county's part, because their types of roads, for example, Chip and Seal Road, um, could have a tendency to fail. Um, and I, I know I remember on the regional planning commission level when we changed the regional planning commission changed those regulations. It's because usually between year one and year two is when you see the failure and the bond is if it's a one-year bond, the bond's gone. Um, I think it's especially important um, to consider this because of the situation out of Stonehill subdivision. Similar situation, similar type road construction. Um, and maybe to consider too, who is the bond issued in favor of? Is that issued in favor of the, uh, you know, the regional planning commission, the county commissioners, the township trustees? Um, in the case of if it's issued to the city, then does that obligate the city in some manner to go out and work on the road in case, you know, some work is required at a later date? Well, in the past, has the has the bond been issued to the city or to the county? In the case of Stonehill, the bond was issued to the county commissioners. Um, but in some cases, it's in the past, it's been issued to the city. <coughs> My own preference would be that it be issued in favor of the person or the entity that's going to possibly have to, it's going to maintain the road or, or, uh, mm -hmm. or get some kind of reimbursement from the bond in order to repair the road. Which would be the township trustees. In this case, um, well, it's initially it'd be the county commissioner, okay. uh, excuse me, the county engineer, um, but prop ultimately, I believe this would be considered a township road. Okay. Um, questions. So this is a request for a final plat approval. Is that what I'm hearing, or a no? Hmm. So as we can do. <laughs> okay. Um, I do have a couple. Can I comment on a couple things he said okay. there? Yes. Um, as far as the, the road, um, the, the part that would be most likely to fail, I believe, would be the hill, the, the entry going in. And it's already stone. It's eight-inch base. Um, 
eight inch compacted base as set forth in the in the county uh, regulations I was providing um, and it is not I mean it's it's solid and it will be additional on top of that but um, the rest of it is pretty flat um, and uh, you know I understand if there's a requirement for the bond I don't have a problem with that but um, I don't want to be penalized for something that happened to somebody else in the past. I'm planning on living up here uh, if I can ever get this done. And um, obviously, I don't want the road to be, uh, you know, I want the road to be appropriately uh, maintainable, if that's a word. Um, the slope, the grade, and all that is, is engineered in, uh, the engineer plan is, is as county requires. Um, so that's, and it will need to be tweaked a little bit, the final drawing, but it is essentially done uh, at this point. Um, and, oh, as far as the sign-off, uh, when you were asking Steve about um, township trustee signing off and all that, I, I've been, it depends on who you talk to, what the requirements are. And, and I'd like to have, um, what I'm basically asking for is if somebody needs to sign off, uh, that the form is provided to me for them to sign. So I don't have to generate something and, and, and try it and have everybody say no and then I generate something else and have people say no and I, I'm really getting frustrated by that kind of um, the way it's going. So um, I guess that's it. Okay. Questions? Um, I know in my packet I've got an email from January 2nd saying that it requires a uh, P to sign off on, on, on your road. Or a what to sign off? Uh, a professional engineer I assume, right? For Yes. Okay. Do you, and you have one of those signed he, off? He's a professional engineer design. I have the road layout, and, and he needs to. We have to adjust a little ditching and stuff like that, but it's basically done. And the next, it has to be accepted by the county engineer. Has that been done? The county engineer um, signed off on the on the original plat. Um, I really can't remember if they've signed off on the road design or not. I think I think so. Yeah. Okay. And um, I assume the health department signs off on the septic systems, right? The health department, they, Mr. Hammer's here, yes. so he can address any questions. But as I understand it now, um, he had some questions after I've had a soil scientist on the property twice, digging holes. Um, and Mr. Hammer had some questions after the second time. And I had the soil scientist come down, and we all sat at the health department and talked. And I, I believe he's got that all worked out, except for specifying uh, as I understand it each person that buys a lot will have to say my house is um, going to be a certain place on the lot and it's going to be so many square feet or so many bedrooms or whatever and then they'll approve it for them um, but as I understand it the, the general macro approval is there any other questions um, I'd like to hear from mr. hammer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, my name is uh, Chuck Hammer. I'm the administrator at the City County Health Department. Um, and uh, we've been reviewing this subdivision for several years. And uh, I've got a pretty good stack of correspondence between uh, the department and Mr. Hoisington. And there's a couple issues that still need to be taken care of here. And uh, uh, Dave referred to a requirement that we are considering to put some kind of language on the property deeds themselves or on the plat. And that's a little bit unusual because people have to come and get a permit from the city county health department for development of a private sewage system when they develop that. Um, but what's happened here is the, the soils and the, the, uh, on these lots, uh, according to the data that uh, uh, Mr. Hoisington submitted to us, has got some severe limitations in terms of putting on on-site sewage systems. It's possible to do it, but it's going to be difficult. Um, we unfortunately went through a transition, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, between what were called the old rules uh, from the Ohio Department of Health to new rules and um, under the old rules these lots probably could not be developed with on-site systems. Under the new rules there's additional options that are available to developers 
and um, so it opens the door for these lots to be developed. However, the old standby traditional systems that are the simplest, cheapest uh, to put in, the most reliable systems are probably not possible uh, on these lots either uh, in, for initial installation or for the um, uh, required replacement area. So uh, in the last year or so, uh, I've been working with the planning commissions to develop criteria for what, what kind of lots do we want to create in Athens County. And generally speaking, the input I've got from the planning commissions has been that we need a, a large array of options on any given lot so that the developers of those lots, when they put a house on it, have multiple design options. They can put a cheap, cheaper system or a more expensive system that they want to, to deal with sewage disposal. These lots, unfortunately, are going to tend to be more expensive in terms of developing and putting on successful on-site sewage treatment systems. So that is the reason we would like to put that information right up front on the deed. So anybody buying these properties doesn't assume that they've got this large, you know, a, a multiple array of options to put sewage systems. They may be quite restricted in what they're able to do. And um, the last uh, communications that uh, uh, Mr. Hoisington and I have had, uh, I've requested that he provide some information that was alluded to in the soil scientist report but not included in the packet to me. So we're uh, trying to work out getting that uh, information. Uh, so um, the analysis was under the old rules and done under the old, old rules and you're saying that it's it can be the new rules are a little bit more flexible or rather more um, can allow the development of these lots yeah the, the assessment of the lot is the same you okay. know, I mean you're looking at the soil that's there. same way yes and uh, the native soil is there and that's what it is uh, the new rules have other design options that people can employ in disposing of uh, sewage effluence on a lot you have to keep it contained on the lot. There has to be some sort of soil-based leaching system to absorb the, the uh, septic effluence from these homes. Uh, so in other words, you can't have like a treatment system with an open pipe discharging. That's uh, forbidden by state requirement. At the Regional Planning Commission, you had said that the old septic system, the aerator system, is no longer viable? Well, no, aerator systems are fine as a pretreatment device. Okay. But they have to, in any new construction, Still has to have a leach bed. they have to go in. So you can reduce the size of a leach field, you can modify the design of it if you pretreat. Mm -hmm. And an aerator is a, is a, a suitable way to pretreat. All of these lots are going to require pretreatment. Um, and all of these lots, or most of them, are going to require some kind of a modified leach field um, to deal with the sewage effluent, either on the initial installation or replacement area. They're just difficult soils. Mm. I did look at the case file. I think you had said lot number five was questionable at the time. Is that? Well, lot number five is a special case because both on the initial installation and on the replacement area, the soils are uh, limited to the point where you're going to have to have an elevated leach field or a mound type system, which is a legitimate way of dealing with sewage, but you don't have those simpler, lower tech options uh, available to that lot at all. So your recommendation is this is good to go? Um, you know, uh, again, over the last year or so, in this transition to these new rules. One of the requirements we had was to coordinate with the Planning Commission and uh, we came up with a little chart uh, that gave a, uh, an array of options. So when we review the soil work, we use this document and it says, uh, based on the submitted information for this lot in our review, the soils appear suited to the following uh, design types for an on-lot home sewage treatment system. And the two above the dotted line are 
kind of the simple, traditional, low energy, reliable systems that most people use. Mm. Below the dotted lines are the higher tech elevated leach fields or mound systems or drip irrigation systems that are just, uh, you know, generally used in response to very difficult site conditions. What we had talked about in the planning commissions is that in creating new lots, anything above, if, if you could check the boxes above the dotted lines, we would generally favor those lots being created in the county. Mm -hmm. If they're below the dotted lines, we would not. Simply because you're creating lots that have very difficult restrictions and less options available. So uh, since this process, you know, so if this was coming to us brand new, even though these were all legal systems, we would recommend that the, the lots not be created. However, we've been working with Mr. Hoisington for several years, and so we're trying to accommodate that and make it very clear on the plat that we can uh, uh, make it clear to the purchasers and developers of these properties that they're going to take some special circumstances to get them developed in terms of sewage disposal. Mm. So, if we give uh, if we give final approval <coughs> to this project, then one of the things that we, we could require is that the uh, notation about the septic system be on the on the plan yes. and be on the deeds. Yeah, and I and I expect I'll get the complete information from the soil scientist. Uh, there was a reference to an Order One soil survey map, which I've not received, and. Um, Anyway, I expect all that to be, uh, those are minor details that I think we can uh, work out. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> now, what happens if through these higher technology um, systems that they fail, um, what happens in that instance with the homeowners? They're required to reinstall, uh, and if they can't because the sites are so limited? Well, the, the sites are, uh, uh, our review requires that there be room to put in an initial sewage treatment system, and we've reviewed these for four bedroom houses, so that's the footprint. Mm -hmm. The bedrooms relate to the amount of wastewater that we estimate coming from a home, so a two bedroom home would have less than a four. These were reviewed for a four bedroom, or a four bedroom house, which obviously is less effluent than would come from a six bedroom house. Mm -hmm. At any rate, we require that the lot have room for an initial installation of a soil-based leaching system to deal with that four-bedroom effluent and a, an area to completely replace that. So if the first one failed, they would have to put in a second one. And all these lots have passed that initial yes. requirement? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think all of them except one, the, the replacement field would be the higher tech kind of a field, a more expensive and energy intensive system. And then lot five would be the higher tech system first and second, uh, according to the data that we've received from the developer. So in essence, these lots are buildable with um, high tech expensive septic systems. Is If yeah, you were to I, have yeah. truth in like advertising to people. Um, about septic systems. Yeah, I think you you know you could characterize them as high tech. There you know there's pretreatment. There's they're a little bit more difficult to design. Uh, they you have to take a lot of care to install them so that they're done right. And the maintenance is generally more significant. And you have some over some overview of that when they're being installed. And yes. Okay. We inspect. Uh, of course, we review the specific information when the development's occurring, when those actual homes being built and the sewage systems being installed. And then we look at them as they're being installed. So we inspect the pipe as it's going in, make sure the connections are correct, make sure everything's going in according to an approved design plan. And then we do um, uh, an operational inspection. We do a cover inspection so that we okay the, the system to be covered up and put into operation and then we do uh, a series and in a subdivision it would be an annual uh, operational inspection to make sure they're working properly okay. and being maintained. Okay. Does, Bob, does Bob want to say anything? Uh -huh. 
Citizen of the Year. Citizen of the Year, yes. <laughs> Don't give a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Bob Eichenberg, County Planner. I can go over the um, steps for road approval because there, I, I think, is confusion about that, mm -hmm. and it does get a little bit complicated. So maybe I can clarify that a bit. <clears throat> if a road's to be uh, accepted for public maintenance, whether it's city or county. It'll need to be designed by a professional engineer, and we'll have to have a, a set of plans, and Mr. Hoisington um, had that. Um, they, were, they were marked up, so they're not necessarily an as-built, and I think he realizes he'll have to have you know, as-built plans. And those will come in with the final plat. I mean, you shouldn't approve the final plat without that as a piece of supporting documentation. And. Um, <clears throat> I have asked that on the final plat, the county engineer have a sign-off on there um, since it is going to be a road that's got to be accepted by the, the county system and it'll be maintained by the trustees. Um, whether you have the trustee's signature on there is really up to you. Um, as a courtesy type of thing, it probably wouldn't hurt to have them signing off too. But uh, my understanding is that technically, legally, the trustees can't really say no. Even if they don't like it, they, all they have is a courtesy review. In fact, on the Regional Planning Commission plats, we have changed the language where the trustees sign to just say, we have reviewed this instead of we have approved this. Um, the, the authority for accepting roads into the county system is totally up to the county commissioners. And they will rely almost totally on the recommendation of the county engineer. And so that is why I, I would have both the county engineer and the county commissioners signing off on plats that involve roads that are going to go into the county system. Um, because that plat is the legal document. And it's, it's always been my um, attempt or policy to try to try to not have too many documents associated with the plat, especially if they're legal documents that have to be filed. I like to have as much of that on the plat itself. Um, so <clears throat> when we talk about sign-offs, ideally, I'd like to see on these roads that are going to become county roads or township roads, have the township trustees, the county engineer, and the county commissioners signing off with just a review for the trustees. But that way, everybody involved has at least had a say in it. But it's important to remember the county commissioners are the final authority. If the trustees don't like it, and even if the county engineer says don't do it, they can still say we'll take the road. Um, <clears throat> another sign off that we require with the uh, engineered plans, uh, once the road is built, we ask that the uh, professional engineer that um, Dave is using sign off that at each stage of construction it was built according to the plans because the county doesn't have the capacity to be out there inspecting full time when, when the road's built so we put that burden back on their professional engineer. So that's a submittal that should come in with the final plans. And then whatever portion of the road or other improvements isn't completed at the time of final plat acceptance there's supposed to be an engineer's estimate that says this much work is yet to be done, this is how much it'll cost, and this is the bond amount to cover that in the event it's not built. And then as um, Steve pointed out, the county, and unfortunately due to past situations, but that's how you know most of these rules come into, into play, we have adopted a a fairly stringent policy of a two-year maintenance bond at 100 percent of the original engineer's estimate. So the, the engineer will have to have that estimate of what the road cost, and that's what the maintenance bond will be in the event of a failure. And we've had some pretty big failures out there that cost a lot of money to fix. And the trustees, by, by the time they're the maintainer of the road, 
they're the ones that get the burden of going back and fixing it. So that's why we try to get them involved, even though they don't have a formal legal <coughs> no with the approval. We want their input. So, so it is kind of a complicated system, but it's the best we've got. And the bond should be posted with the county in this. Case. I would recommend that, yeah, with the county commissioners. Questions? Can I address one? Can we address one thing? Sure. Quickly? Come on up to the. Um, back to to what Mr. Hammer was saying about the the systems, and, and I'm I've always been on board with. Uh, as long as I knew where the where the writing was going to be, what, what we're going to put, is, and I, you know, I'm not trying to hide anything from potential buyers. Um, we, I hadn't heard of the form he brought up before that uh, with the above the line and below the line stuff, but um, I think as long as the buyers are informed that the the septic system may be expensive, as long as it is a suitable system for that lot, um, should should not be a punitive thing against the lot if they're okay with the cost of that and um, and they know up front that it's it's going to cost that and I'm actually addressing that in the price of the lots I'm keeping them down to where they would be comparable to a um, like a university estates lot that is you know a, a fourth of an acre or less that has public sewer um, they're, they're going to pay less for this lot that's two three five acres whatever and they're going to have the same total cost in it as a, as a, as a much smaller lot um, so I just want to make sure that that it shouldn't be seen as a punitive thing against these lots is what I'm, well, that's, if that's clear. Are you um, reluctant to put something on the deeds? Is no. that Oh, okay. No, not at all. I just, yeah. I was referring more to, to what Mr. Hammer brought up, that form that said if, we, if they're above right. the line, we recommend they're okay, mm -hmm. and if they're below, if, if that's an acceptable system, uh, environmentally why environmental wise um, it shouldn't be ruled out just because it's more expensive if the as long as the developer of that law the, the builder of the house understands that they have to put in a more expensive system it was my, was my yeah. yeah it can be written anywhere it needs to be okay Any question? Um, in terms of what Bob was talking about the um, <coughs> review from the engineer and every stage of the road being built was that done and signed off on well, it's not built yet. What he has seen, what's there? Yes, he hasn't signed anything off on there. Again, there's no real form. But um, the there, last there time he was, form, there is a form. Yeah. I've got During the process. I've got the form. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, he has been. He has seen what's done so far, and and did say uh, the last time he was with me up there that as we put uh, gravel on the rest of it because it's supposed to be eight inch base. That he would be there to confirm that there is eight inches of base, and, and it is such. Um, but the stone that we have on there, he was not there while it was being laid down. But he has seen it. I have not had I have not had him sign off on anything to this point. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. <clears throat> now we're considering this for preliminary approval, right? Or for um, final, final approval. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And with, <laughs> okay. Again, Steve Pearson, zoning administrator. Um, there's not been an application for final approval. Oh, okay. There, at the city code, re, there's a, a list of things that have to be submitted. Um, in the case of projects outside the city, sometimes the, um, some of those submittal requirements have been waived. Um, However, even though it's going to be outside the city, as I mentioned before, I believe technically variances have to be granted for it. You don't have five foot sidewalks. You don't have curb and gutter. Any of those, you know, those kinds of things because the city is planning within three miles and I believe that law uh, was established because there is possibly some expectation that that could be in the city someday. So in other words, the project needs to have these waivers, mm -hmm. um, essentially, or variances that the Planning Commission will recommend to Council. Um, Chip and Seal Road, for example, instead of the city requires uh, hard surface, concrete, or uh, asphalt. 
another variance just to establish in the record with the council approval ordinance of the project that it was under these set of rules and these variances were granted so there's and, not been a formal application okay so then mr. Hoisington needs to make a formal application and uh, we need to get a list of the variances that that, that would require and we need to get an approval in writing for Mr. Hammer about how it's going to be um, how it's going to be approved and the requirement for um, description of the sewage, of the septic system on the on the lot deeds and on the plat and we need the ODOT permit. Um, and the information about the bond? We need the posting well, not bond. information. When, you need when does bond. that have? We, we need, need the bond. bond. We need the bond. And the, the, the different um, documents that um, Bob Eichenberg was talking right. about. Right. And the approval of all the, about the road. The road seems to be a whole separate um, <clears throat> list of things that we need besides the variances. Yeah. So, so um, what we have is a, an attempt to blend city regulations and county regulations. Um, that list of things that are required for final submittal are contained in the code. There's not actually an application form. Um, the information that would be required on an application would simply be a listing of the things that are in the code, and that's you know that's available online uh, can be provided to anyone and if all the information wasn't provided then an explanation would be needed and it might be you know well it's not really in the city it's in the county that would be the explanation um, so at this point if mr. Hoisington comes back to you and talks to you about the, what's necessary for the final approval application it will be a combination of things that I will <laughs> point him to in the Athens City Code, plus it require input from uh, um, Bob Eichenberg, the county planner, on behalf of the county engineer and the commissioners, and for all of us, Mr. Hammer, uh, on behalf of the city county okay. health department. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Now, does that tell you where where you stand at this point? Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, then the uh, next case which is 0808, Mark Spezza representing Holzer Docks as a request to subdivide the existing lot into three with additional curb cuts. And uh, would you like to come and explain it, Mr. Spezza? Um, my name is Mark Spezza, Century 21 Classic Gold. Oh, oh okay. I also, uh, okay. uh, I want to point out that uh, uh, Michael Nolan's here, uh, also Sierra Meek. Sierra Meek are yes. here uh, in representation of the Holzer Docks. We came out at the last minute. That's, so you uh, haven't and, signed, have you signed the list? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can we do the table? Yeah. Or, sure. Or the, uh, no, that's, that's fine. You've got mics there. Thank you. <coughs> Are you ready for me? Um, of course, we were here, uh, we were here two weeks ago, and uh, we have uh, uh, three legally platted lots uh, uh, based on uh, the fact these lots are um, uh, in Keenan Township, outside the city limits. Um, these lots were uh, surveyed out last year. Uh, in May, and actually, they were actually approved by the uh, County Engineer's Office uh, May 23rd, 07. And um, uh, what we're here today to do is uh, uh, get approval of these lots uh, through uh, the city process, considering they're within the three mile limit. 
Um, I would like to clarify these are lots that are proposed and they have been approved by the county engineer's office for mathematical mm -hmm. accuracy only. Right. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I, I guess so they're they're not they're approved and not approved. They're not approved. The lines mm -hmm. have been are proposed. The lines have been approved. Right, right. It just okay. means the survey right. closes. Okay. We're here to get uh, input from uh, the uh, Athens Planning Commission on uh, the proposed uh, approval of these lots. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can I ask the question? Yes. Uh, we were out there earlier, took a look around, nice sunny day. Um, they're outside the city, as you mentioned. Yes. Um, I know last time Mr. Hammer was here, there was discussion about the requirement whenever you do a lot split outside the city limits in the county, you require um, uh, evaluation for septic systems. Has that been done? Um, well, it, uh, it uh, has not been done uh, based on the fact that, uh, uh, for example, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Hammer, Chuck Hammer, uh, would be involved in the process of approving these lots if they were residential lots. Uh, if they uh, uh, are commercial lots, uh, we would need to get uh, approval from the EPA. Uh, so we potentially could go to the EPA and uh, uh, get approval for small packaging systems for these lots. Okay. And is that your intention? Uh, yes. Okay. And do you have water to the lots from the Axe, Tuppers Plains, or the city? Uh, currently, there is uh, water to uh, uh, the whole parcel from One the city town. of Athens, although there is Tupper's Plains water uh, mm. within uh, 300 feet of the lot. Mm. Okay. So potentially, Tupper's Plains water could supply the water uh, to the lot or lots, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just trying to clarify. No, 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 no it out. please okay. just keep. You know, uh, okay. Going to give you the information as you ask. And is there any thought about whether um, annexation will occur or not? Um, there was some discussion last year about uh, annexation with uh, the previous administration, and uh, it uh, appeared as if there. Um, um, uh, may have been. Um, let me just, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but uh, it appeared as if there uh, would have been some extensive uh, requirements for annexation through the previous administration. It appeared as if uh, that might be problematic. So we went ahead and uh, mm -hmm. uh, gone, uh, gone to the steps of preparing these lots so they can be sold as quickly as possible. <clears throat> Potential buyers could, at some point uh, in the future, go to the city and annex. One by one. Pardon? <laughs> one by one. Well, you have you know, five-acre lots. Uh, getting a five-acre lot annexed into the city, I would think, would be uh, a benefit, a huge benefit. Uh, you could potentially have uh, three separate buyers who have three separate attitudes. You could have a, a buyer that perhaps would buy two lots. You would have 10 acres that could be annexed into the city. You may have a buyer that would go, well, we don't really want our lot annexed into the city. We're going to, uh, uh, we're going to uh, uh, build uh, a large storage facility and we'll need a small packaging plant. Um, I have a question to procedure, I guess, Steve. Mm -hmm. what, what I've provided the Planning Commission are copies of an application for an opening permit, mm -hmm. not for a minor subdivision. Mm -hmm. Uh, originally, several weeks ago, Mr. Spezza came uh, to the Code Enforcement Office with, I believe it was an application for zoning certificate for use permit. Um, attached were the surveys and uh, the drawings showing the curb cuts. Uh, zoning does not apply outside the city. And then my, in speaking with Mr. Spezza, I was trying to determine what the request was for. Was it for access to the public street? Was it for the minor subdivision of the land? Did it include annexation? Who, um, if it was for the subdivision of land, who was going to provide the water and sewer service? 
Uh, would that be counsel for extension of utilities outside the city? Would there be a request for annexation? And so just to try to get this thing in motion, um, we filled out an application for a curb cut because that seemed to be, to me, um, the most pertinent or most immediate request um, you know, to, to have access to three proposed lots. Um, one of the requirements, there are five requirements for minor subdivision of land. The fourth requirement is approval by either the OEPA um, or the City County Health Department for sewage disposal. Uh, in this case, it would be the OEPA. So an application, there is an application form for minor subdivision of land, um, and that's in the city and within three miles of the city. That's one of the things that has to be accomplished is that fourth requirement, um, that there is some kind of health jurisdiction approval. Um, and so there are several ways to do that on this property, but not, nothing had been presented. One of the requirements is one that has been provided, a, a check of math accuracy by the county engineer's office. What they do is they run a program to make sure the survey, the survey closes, is what it's called, that it actually is an accurate description of the acreage. Mm -hmm. So it looks like that's been done. Another requirement is that the uh, survey be done by a professional surveyor, and that's been accomplished. So for minor subdivision, the only thing that's lacking is sewage disposal. Then the question, then an application for curb cut, that's, a, that's, an, a, that's in Title IX of the city code. 21 subdivision, Title IX is uh, where the service safety director uh, can only approve access uh, to a street. And that's why I had forwarded this uh, to Ms. Mosley, the service safety director, and she brought it to you as a planning commissioner, a uh, planning commission, because there's all these layered things that are, <laughs> that are going on here. You know, and subdivision, if that's proposed, even minor subdivision is under the jurisdiction of the Planning Commission. Yeah, I know, Madam Chair, when you had come to, to my office yesterday, I was, you know, kind of just at the very last minute on this. I, did, I actually did not realize that they, I had assumed that because it was coming here that, they had, that there had been an application for a minor subdivision. So absent that, I mean, there's really no official action uh, you know, for the Commission to take on that today. Thank you. Could I ask yes. a question? Mr. Nolan, mm -hmm. yes. Steve, let me ask you a couple of questions. And as I said, I'm coming into this late in the game, mm -hmm. or perhaps from what I've heard so far today, maybe early in the game. <laughs> uh, would it be possible for these lots to be provided with water and sewer of the city? Uh, my understand. Not, if they're not annexed? My understanding is that only Adams City Council can approve the extension of water and sewer service outside the city, and to my knowledge, no such request uh, has been received. Where is the infrastructure for the water and sewer as it relates to the to this parcel of land? Is it right beside it? Um, generally speaking, when anyone asks to access public utilities, um, be it through council or just in general, you already have a lot in the city. Uh, Nick Carr, the director of the water and sewer department, along with Nick Joseph, the water supervisor, and Scott Lambert, the sewer supervisor, identify the location, um, the type of service, um, its capacity, what type of system is involved. And so those are all things um, you know, to be taken into consideration. Um, to access public utilities. I know out there we've got multiple, I don't know exactly where they're at, we have multiple water lines, multiple sewer lines. Some sewer lines will operate by gravity, some are forced, they're under pressure. Um, there are lines that are private, there are lines that are public, so. But as the, as the lines go in the eastward direction out to the New Holzer Clinic, mm -hmm. that is provided with uh, water and sewer by the city, isn't it? Yes, there's properties further east that are provided water and sewer service that are currently inside the city. And that's on the same side of the street as Holter Docks property? Yes. So if uh, access uh, to the water and sewer for this parcel were requested, it, it wouldn't appear that uh, physics would uh, uh, prohibit it, would it? Mm. Anything can be overcome by engineering, as far as I know. All right. Just like sewage disposal systems, some are less expensive, some are more expensive. Right. Some, some means of accessing sewer, for example, would be more ex expensive and involve more engineering than others. Thank you. <clears throat> I have, I have a, another question for Steve. Uh, there, uh, currently, um, uh, 
is a water tap on the property. The uh, property uh, has uh, always had uh, water service from the city. Um, I guess my question is, would that service uh, continue with the uh, new owners, or is that something that uh, uh, would be uh, prohibited or denied at this point? Okay. First thing I'd like to point out is I'm not the utilities director for the city of Athens, neither am I the director of the water and yeah. sewer department, and neither am I the city planner. Could I? I'll try to answer the questions no, as best I can, minute. though, as the zoning administrator. <laughs> Could I uh, interrupt a minute? Um, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves here since this it, there isn't an application for a minor subdivision at this point. And uh, you can't really answer for all the utility departments and for city council about the policies about extending water and sewer service. And I know that one of the things that city council has had to consider is the capacity of the water treatment plant and the sewage treatment plant. And since these are, are probably going to be commercial lots if the split is allowed, um, we don't really know what the demand for utilities will be. And uh, I, I think there's no point in discussing that at this point because we're really talking about whether or not uh, you're going to apply for a minor subdivision. So that would be the next, applying for the minor subdivision would be the next step. Am I? Sounds like correct. I think, and, I think that's true. And it sounds like it's either going to be uh, residential would be the health department or, or the Ohio EPA yeah. to have some kind of uh, survey purview or analysis. Yeah, we'd have, we would have to, before we even decided on the lot split, we'd have to have an approval from either the health department or the, or the Ohio EPA. Um, so until uh, you get to that stage and we have an application for a minor subdivision, then I don't think that there's any point in our hearing it and taking your time for it and, and uh, asking Steve to make projections. Understand. Oh, Thank yes, you. And, for yeah, we were here uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, 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 actually proposing this uh, uh, this very project. And uh, again, we were under the assumption that we had uh, the correct forms. We had used the correct city forms, and uh, we're actually told to come back uh, to today's meeting uh, for a hearing on that. Um, I, I just want to make that point clear that uh, we were under the impression that this was going to be heard today. Well, I'm sorry about that, but uh, what I have is application for opening permit, and I do have a different case that was an application for a minor subdivision, so the form exists and the pro protocol exists. I, th I think one of the problems last meeting was that we got the paperwork, we didn't get the paperwork um, ahead of the meeting, um, so mm -hmm. that legitimately we couldn't really review that case today, and we couldn't review that case that week. And so now um, we can review it because we have the paperwork. And now and what we're saying is, is that there's a kind of a process to go through. Um, and so that's the process you need to go through. I think that's what my recollection, and we can look at the minutes, mm -hmm. that that happened. We weren't really reviewing the case that week. We were saying, you know, that it was out of, yeah, we, we couldn't do it. We reviewed this week. Yeah. So. So thank, thank you for you. coming. Okay, um, communications? Madam Chair, can I ask if there was anything else that I might potentially be needed for? I don't think so. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation just to say uh, generally in the future, certainly if there are any issues to where you think there may be a potential for needing advice from uh, from my office, I'm certainly happy to make myself available just to try to give me some heads up, you know, a few days in advance as to what the, the issues might be. Okay. And uh, certainly happy to help out. Do you routinely get the uh, agenda? I actually, I don't. So oh, okay. if I can be included on that, that'd be great. The last clerk to put you on the motion. Okay, Please. great. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Do we have a PowerPoint today? Um, we'll find out in communications, no. I guess. <laughs> it's all mm -hmm. just use. There are no communications? Are there communications? I don't have I don't have any. Maybe there is a um, 
Okay, the next announcements and other business. Next meeting is May 1st at 12 noon. Uh, we have the amendments to the Wellhead Protection Ordinance, which uh, Safety Service Director gave us last time. I have a few questions about these, Paul. Um, Page three, um, under facility, the paragraph on facility. This definition includes but is not limited to buildings except private and private residential homes, storage areas, industries, and so on. I'm not quite sure um, why it exempts private residential homes. <laughs> and the way I read it, it's almost like exempting everything after that, too. Um, that's, I had trouble with that, yeah, but I I'm guess that's, English yeah. major, so I don't know why. No, I think that's, that. yeah. Page three. Okay, okay. Any idea? I could ask for clarification. Okay. Um, have you been working with the ad hoc committee that put this, is that where these came from? Um, these? This came from uh, the Wellhead Protection Team, active team, meaning Crystal Kennard, okay. um, Nick Carr, and Michael Cooper from the City County Health Department. It has indeed been forwarded to council indicated uh, both Miro Grimm and uh, Heather Cantina. Heather Cantina. Uh, and uh, it also needs to be forwarded to Kathy Hecht uh, right. for that. Council at council's meeting Monday, they felt that uh, the Planning Commission didn't have purview or what have you to um, review, it. review it, even though on page 7 it says any future modifications shall also be recommended to the Planning Commission. I told them once we recommend it to them, they're welcome to strike that and we have plenty of work to right. do. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I think that, that it sounds to me as the City Council is going to take this and also do some other uh, adjustments and modifications. Okay. Right. So oh. do you want to... <laughs> Do you want to have our comments or not? It's up to them. <laughs> um, yeah, we might as well see what needs to be changed on this. We still have uh, control over it. There weren't really well, very I think we can make <clears throat> in, insightful suggestions and they can ignore them. Okay. How's that? Cool. Okay. Um, I, when looking at some of this, um, there's some, um, I want to see wording relating to least toxic biological maintenance procedures in it. For recreational, for everything, or what? Um, for, for residential, industrial, rec well, commercial, uh, recreational, industrial landscapes. There's a question of whether a golf course is commercial or recreational. Mm -hmm. you know, because there's a difference between best management practices and um, requiring least toxic biological maintenance. Best management practice means that you just kind of follow the rules that, you know, the forestry service puts together or something, um, which does not necessarily mean that they're going to use the least toxic methods. They just use toxic methods under, you know, best management. They clean up, as Scott's people say, you know, um, sweep your driveway after you put the fertilizer down. It's not the same thing. So. Um, that needs to look at and, and kind of figure it out through the through the document. Do we want to uh, strike the exception for residential housing? Is that what I mean? I don't. No, I don't think so. But I think I think you're right. It exempts everything else. The way too. it's just common common. And it needs to be. Yeah, it needs to be. Uh, probably residential housing exception needs to be put at the end, mm -hmm. and then have it apply to everything else. Okay. Um, it's just that sentence that I don't think does what they wanted it to do. Mm -hmm. um, I had another question on page 21, the first sentence at the top uh, needs just to be kind of redesigned. Um, if stormwater runoff is determined to be a possible source of contamination, 
because stormwater runoff, if determined to be a possible source of contamination, the creation of a vegetative buffer shall be required. It okay. doesn't Next. flow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a matter of <clears throat> readjusting it. Yeah. And um, then I've got a note on 22 about the red section. Mm -hmm. um, parts that have changed. Should we, uh, shouldn't there be a permit required from the health department for residential treatment systems? Because it says all residential sewage treatment systems shall be permitted by the ACCHD and be maintained by the owner in accordance with ACCHD regulations. So you're saying you want a sentence there saying we must have a written permission or uh, a permit? A written permit, yeah. yeah a written permit. Okay. And all the same permitted. thing for the, yeah. In writing. Yeah, why don't we do that? Okay. We'd love to be in more and more work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then down again at the next to last, uh, all commercial septic systems shall right. so be provided in writing. Okay. 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 And, uh, Those were really the only things I had beside the request to have mm -hmm. some more things included in the acronyms that, to keep recurring in here. And, and they are explained in the text, but it's hard to um, sometimes to go back and find them in the text. So you want to uh, add more to the definitions? Yeah. Or the acronyms? The acronyms. Yeah. Okay. That's um, Page six. And I put a list, I, I made a list of things that, uh, that are not necessarily technical things for BMP, mm -hmm. I assume, is best management mm -hmm. practices, but uh, MSDS. Okay, uh, MSDS. Is. And uh, WHPA and WHPBC, I think, would be helpful to have there, too. Okay. And I also thought it might be helpful to have the acronyms in an alpha list. Oh, that would be so much too easy. Put things up more easily. <laughs> Otherwise, those were the only. Um, the other thing is, I, I think there are other, um, during the formation for wellhead policy, I, I think there are other members besides Mural and Heather who were involved, but I don't remember the names, so maybe we can try. And I was told those two and, and Kathy Hutt. Mm -hmm. And then, um, again, council's going to be taking this and mm -hmm. reworking it okay. as a whole. Yeah, yeah. we have... I'm glad they're doing this. Yeah. It's definitely new. Yeah. We have um, arrow 308. So, request for council. Do we need a formal motion oh. to recommend to city council or... If, um, if they want our <coughs> if they want our recommendations, <laughs> are we done with sure? Them? Why don't we? Do are we done? It? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I move we submit this to council with our recommendations. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Um, all right, the next one is the uh, resolution R08, R0308. Um, resolution requesting the Athens City Planning Commission to consider amending the zoning re code regarding outside business operations near residential zones within the city of Athens. Um, Steve, do you have any words about this? Um, I haven't received a copy of it, so I'm not sure okay. what it says. But it sounds like. Um, Come on, grab a copy. That's why we have to deal with it. That's right. This is aligned with our existing noise ordinance. Yes, it is. Right. 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 Okay. Is in the section of noise ordinance. I would like to. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'd like to point out that uh, we were discussing at one point of changing some of the um, the requirements in the B3 zone. I remember that the uh, discussion of eateries within 200 feet. Right. Okay. Yeah, fixing 
And, and this one, of course, actually adds on some and actually almost makes it as restricted. Uh, but it's really talking about the noise in terms of this. Right, and the outside mm -hmm. operations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one could still sell donuts inside. Yes. Or sell donuts outside. <laughs> Quietly. Between, <laughs> Quietly. Quietly. Between 12 and 10. So. Right. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, no, but you point out they don't have starting times. So if you had noisy donut eaters in the morning, that could cause a problem. Mm -hmm. and if I may say, when I read yes. this, it's saying shall cease outside operations. It doesn't say get quiet. Right. And so mm -hmm. that's that's different. Mm -hmm. That's different than what I had anticipated. I think, yeah. Okay. So. Um, first thing I think that I could note was is that the eating and drinking establishments now are have to be at least 200 feet away from any R1 or R2 zone. Mm -hmm. In the added regulations, it just says a residential zone, which would include R3. Right. And mm -hmm. I want to say that, um, um, I won't say 100%, but in the 90s of businesses that are eating and drinking establishments, conducting business outside, they probably all are within 200 feet of, a R3, of an R3 zone. Right. So you've you picked up another zone here just by saying a residential right. zone. Um, from what I, when I was talking with Debbie Phillips and uh, about this, is that um, she says that there are people in the R3 zone that have been complaining mm. about um, noise from people eating mm. and drinking outside. And so I think that's the, the rec that's recognizing that people in R3s, you know, are, are you know, they have their residents too. Their residents too, and they have a right to, you know, having reasonable, quiet hours um, right. to address. So that's from what I understand. Um, with that input, then, would it not be reasonable to possibly consider amending the first part to uh, a principal building shall be at least 200 feet away from any R zone? Mm -hmm. If it's, you know, if it's to clarify that. You know, residential mm -hmm. people reside in multifamily zones and duplex zones and single family mm -hmm. zones. Do they not all deserve the same protection? Right. Right. Uh, so maybe just I'm just kind of throwing these things right. out. Here. Right. So that's 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 an issue. Um, I clear either it's an intent issue of whether and it has to be kind of squared up within the same. Um, um, another thing that I might make an observation on is that the zoning code allows for legal non-conforming uses, uh, you know, in the nomenclature known as grandfathered uses. Mm -hmm. Anyone who has a business use established um, that essentially by change of law becomes illegal um, is grandfathered. They're legal non-conforming use. So I would say that any business, um, I'm not an attorney. By any means, but just by simply reading the section on nonconformity in the zoning code, anybody who is currently conducting business at these times would be grandfathered in. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't, wouldn't this be a um, operational? It's not a land use issue. It's not, but it's an operational issue. So if you said that stores need to start closing at nine o'clock instead of nine thirty in the city, that doesn't seem that you, that. From my understanding, grandfathering doesn't cover that sort of thing because it's not—you don't have to go and rebuild things. You don't have to have major costs to change it. It's a—it's an operational thing. But that's something that Pat should probably. Right. I'd recommend that the uh, that Law Director Lang weigh in on that. Do, is this going to affect businesses currently operating, or will it only affect those that request operation after the effective date of the ordinance? Okay. And what about um, starting times? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do they want starting times on That's a good question. Yeah, the homecoming morning can be pretty rowdy. We've been up <laughs> <laughs> Pretty noisy, but, very early in the yes. morning. Well, that's one, one morning. Now, I'm just jumping over. Um, I no, had a question. Sure. I had another yeah. question. Is there any way that we could put in something to um, encourage operators of outside eateries to um, put in noise um, reduction 
devices mm. and such. I am, one of my things is I was looking at some of these outside eateries, and there's a lot that they could do to actually reduce the noise now, short of totally closing down. And they seem not to be available, uh, you know, being able to do that for whatever reason. Is there a way, you know, and council may want to look at this and say, you know, that, that they do some noise reduction <coughs> development or something. So, you know, big trees, trees have great evergreens. Well, even an, an awning, I mm -hmm. would think, would help to cut down the noise. Yes. Um, okay, if I remember, we had a discussion at the B3 zones just re earlier about the Stimson Avenue and the fact that the, the way I was reading is that you couldn't have a restaurant within mm -hmm. 200 feet of any R1 and R zone. Mm -hmm. zone. Mm -hmm. So to, to say let's restrict the activity in general, um, it's probably not the same thing we were talking about a month and a half ago or two months ago. Um, we're really talking about here is actually trying to cut down on the noise considerations or the outside operations that create noise. Right. Um, I would probably try looking at and see if we want to change, one is we're going to change some of the B3 zone. We should think about changing to allow eateries within a certain distance, but we want to restrict the amount of outside operations, which I think mm -hmm. the way it was struck through, if you remember, was the, the drive-throughs and the carry-outs. Mm -hmm. um, in the wine garden, yes. Um, I think we want to change, change around. Not just say, okay, all zones are three zones. I think we want, to, you know, we want to concentrate on, on getting rid of the noise rather than just getting rid of the business. Uh, in terms of grandfather status, I thought there was a section somewhere in the code, and I don't have it from me with me. Something about declaring certain operations a nuisance and therefore getting rid of them, <laughs> regardless of whether they're conforming or non-conforming. Mm. And that would be the next. We, that's another trip why you want to look at and say, okay, if this is a problem, that's where you go with it. But I, I don't have that ordinance in front of me or that section of code in front of me. But I seem to recall something about that in there. When that you talk is, about the uses. Yeah, I'm sorry. There is a section called termination of nonconforming use. It has to do with application by, I believe, 50% of the residents within a certain distance. Um, I believe they petitioned the Board of Zoning Appeals mm -hmm. to terminate the nonconforming use based on nuisance. Okay. So that's in that section that I referenced about nonconforming use. And that can occur anywhere at any time. So there are ways to terminate nonconforming uses. Yes, thank you. Okay. That are, I, I that are shown that to be a nuisance and petitioned as such for consideration, I believe it's to the zoning board um, by residents in Sounds the area. Good. Okay. So there is a way to, uh, to, to deal with a problem um, that has been zoned out. Uh, do you think that considering we were talking about the redoing the, the B zone requirements and so on, and, and now we have this, uh, is it worth our having a work session to try to work out what we'd like to have changed okay. altogether in, the, in that part of the zone? Mm -hmm. I have no problem, no problem. Uh, Set aside okay. some time in the next meeting if you want. Okay. Or, um, and I, I will tell you, I, I do not have a plan on board, probably not till, you know, when? end of the month. Oh, okay. <laughs> At least, no, actually, to when? May? June. Oh, June. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Well, maybe we just, just so set know. aside a file for the planet. We are. We will. It's about this <laughs> First of all, we'll run around in front of a town hall meeting and see when he survives. That's the intention, at least. Anything but yeah, I think in this case, we should look at it all entirely. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Another thing I'd like to point out, too, this looks like it's proposed to go in the section for B3 zoning mm -hmm. um, and not B2 or B2D. Um, so, for example, um, in B3s right now where there's outdoor eating and drinking, just, I mean, East State Street, uh, Stimson Avenue, uh, the Richland Corridor is B2, um, and then there would be um, anything north of State Street in the uptown area, which is the far end of Stimson B2D. Corridor. Right. Um, so those businesses below State Street in the downtown area would not be affected by this, any outdoor eating or drinking. Another thing I'd like to point out too, um, this has some conflict with the current regulations regarding tables, benches, and chairs in the uptown area. You can actually have eating, not drinking, I mean you could drink a Pepsi, but you can eat and drink non-alcoholic beverages on the sidewalks um, in the B2D district with a permit so long as the business is open. There used to be a time when it, that was 
shut down. Even if your business was still open, you had to bring your tables and chairs back in the business. Mm -hmm. But the council made a change that said if the business is open, you can eat and drink with a permit out on the sidewalk. So I don't know if this would mean then that those people would have to go back in. So they need to look at that. Council needs to. Chris is taking all this down, I can tell. <laughs> so to make it, I, I, what I see is that if it's not applying to P, B, 2D zones or some other of the zones, that it's an issue of fairness. Why only B3 versus these other, you know, so they have, that needs to be addressed. And then this other kind of, some of the. Um, Right. Is I'm, that part of State Street below, or Court Street, I'm sorry, is the part of Court Street north of State Street B3? It is. Yes. Uh, the Planning Commission has recommended at least on two occasions, possibly three, the rezoning. Um, that's been under long consideration. Actually, last year the Planning Commission reduced the uh, height of buildings in the B2D zone, um, possibly in anticipation of that rezoning going through. Um, and I've there's been consideration for parking requirements too, and how they can be used, but the rezoning north of Court Street, north of State, has not yet been accomplished. And I believe that the council did pass uh, that 500, reinstated the 500 foot rule for commercial parking away from the parking garage. Was that passed last year too? I don't think it was. There was consideration that because previously, if you were in the downtown district, you had to be within 500 feet of the parking garage. Uh, that was pre. I'm trying to remember the good last big revisions. I think 2003. 2000, yeah, 2002, 2003 revisions of the zoning code. At that time, because there were very few properties in the B2D district that were further away than 500 feet, why should they, you know, um, work? Uh, what's that called now? Uh, where BW3 is, that far corner on Union Street, mm -hmm. and then anything in the downtown district south of Union was just a little over 500 feet away. So the zoning code was amended to include parking garage privileges for commercial use to all downtown district um, property owners and businesses. B2D. Yeah. yeah, B2D. So I think what, you were, what you're referring to was a consideration to reestablish Okay. The, uh, the 500 foot distance. So, for example, um, as I recall, a, a measurement from the parking garage up, up Court Street towards State falls short of State Street. Mm -hmm. So, any property, if the 500 foot radius restriction were in place, North Court Street was rezoned B2D, they would not have commercial parking privilege at the parking garage. They would have to have on-site parking. Also, if I remember, the the law about the tables on a sidewalk is not in 23. It's in 9, is it? It's in that different section of code, isn't it? Yeah, I believe that it's in business regulations, okay. uh, Title 7, possibly, because that's the section of the code that has restrictions on where business can occur, not on the street, not out of a vehicle, not on public lands, not on the sidewalk. Tables, benches, and chairs ordinance is an exception to those. Uh, it's either in general regs or business regs. You're okay. right, though. It's not in the zoning code. It's not in the zoning code. It's not in the zoning code. So we need to look at that if we're going to be adjusting it by having ceasing outdoor operations. And what defines outdoor operations? Do we have a definition of that? Cease outdoor operations at uh, 10. So there needs to be a definition? Uh, clarification of what clarification. that means. Is it, is it sitting on a table having uh, you know a croissant, a loud croissant? Is it uh, <laughs> crunchy? Uh, well, is it, you know, is it businesses that are like sitting out, you know, you have, uh, what is it, 19 South Court, whatever, Route 19, where they have, you know, food going out a door, a little window there, carry out situation? Mm -hmm. Well, and also somebody mentioned to me on this, um, the question now that it seems to be a lot louder because everybody's smoking outside. Mm -hmm. so, well, that's... Is that out operation <laughs> that outside? A, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, that... that the flick of the lighter is. You can't really hold a. I don't think you can really hold an eating establishment responsible if it makes its patrons go outside and smoke and they're loud when they're 
when they're smoking. They could be walking down the street smoking mm -hmm. and be loud. Mm -hmm. But realize if you have a, a deck party out in the residence and you're loud mm -hmm. and somebody complains, the, the policeman will come there. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter who's out on a deck smoking and making noise. The owner is probably going to get that citation. At least that's the ones I've been doing community service with for four hours mm -hmm. and picking up trash because they were first person to answer the door and they didn't have control of the guy out on the deck. Or maybe they did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, theoretically, he's supposed to have control because it's his house. Mm -hmm. You know, as a business owner, theoretically, you have control because you can refuse the right of of serving. But then they can walk around the corner and smoke, right. and then it's not your problem. <laughs> right, and that, and theoretically, they're not yeah. on their property yeah. anymore. Yeah. Either. So, okay. Do you have anything else you want to communicate to us? Yes. Uh, one more. I'm not to my communications. Oh, oh. oh no. <laughs> no, we well, had we did communications. Oh, you were talking, you were talking to us. To the B3. Yeah. No, he One more comment on this. I believe that there are sections of the comprehensive plan uh, that address outdoor eating and drinking. Okay. You might want to look at the comprehensive yeah. plan and see what it says. My recollection is that it was um, to be encouraged. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. but, you know, I understand the, the problem here uh, eating and drinking is one thing and then you're well, I, you, you you can be just as loud for example uh, you know drinking a root beer float as you can. <laughs> well I mean it's also I think business owners need to take into account the surround I mean Toscano's has a nice outdoor eating and drinking not many people have complained about them so I mean it's also a question of, of trying to now regulate for for ones that exactly. aren't taking into account what's going on around them. So. Because if this applied to, say, for example, Toscano's, they'd have to shut down. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I think there's some distinction for sure that needs clarification. Okay, you have something else you want to communicate to us? Yeah. I wanted to let you know that I, let everyone know that I provided you a, uh, um, a chart, a comparison chart of the large apartment complexes in town. Yeah. And what it does is every possible combination that I could think of uh, to determine how, how dense a project is should be included in that uh, chart. What I added was at the bottom what I call mm -hmm. Procos 1 and Procos mm -hmm. 2. Mm -hmm. Procos 1 would be just the lot area of the uh, corner of uh, Stimson and Palmer Street. Mm -hmm. um, a little over 0.8 acres. The larger number is if I include a number that was provided to me by Mike Knoll, the project architect, um, for the amount of green roof. Mm -hmm. So that, oh, if okay. that would be, if somehow or other that would be included as a measurement of lot area, then it would change just a couple of those numbers. Not many, but a couple of them. That raises the lot area to a little over an acre. Um, I thought it said 32 units on the... What I did on that chart, I have a note from Mr. Prokos. Um, he had originally proposed 30 units. The information you're seeing there is based on a note I got from him that said 29 units. He didn't tell me a reduction in bedrooms. So now he's so, increased one of the units to having five or something. That may be. Okay. I, I included the total number of occupants that he had said, assuming because he told me only a reduction of one unit. He didn't say anything about reducing the number of people. Okay. Uh, the other question I have, I see you have 11 buildings on Summit. Uh, is that a typo? No, I think that says, that was proposed. Does it say proposed Summit of Coats Run? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that was one incarnation of a planned unit development for the Summit of Coats Run. And it does not include the current version, which is yet to be constructed. Okay. And uh, of interest sake, from my point of view, would be another column of the year. Uh, mm -hmm. These were brought into uh, into uh, fruition or existence, I guess is the term. Um, I know, you know construction you, construction dates, yeah, because there was a change in what ninety seven for the requirements, and that would be something we'd notice in this, and that would make a difference, right? Right. Parking, Parking requirements. requirements were one and a half per unit, mm -hmm. um, no matter if it was one person or five people yeah. in a unit um, prior to ninety seven. Uh, it doesn't affect the density yeah. though. Where's Campus Edge? Campus Camp said it was another uh, oh, proposal for the Summit of Coats Run. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
I oh, guess yeah. I, you know, I could have one in there for uh, the Just like company. I forgot what they called theirs. PRS. GMH, that was yeah, one GMH. incarnation. So. Thank you for doing this. That's all right. To go back in explanation, too, if you notice, by reducing the number of units from 30 to 29, mm -hmm. the lot area per dwelling unit goes above 1250. Therefore, a variance wouldn't be necessary hmm. if the proposal was for 29 as opposed to 30 units. Another thing I'd like to point out, too, this takes absolutely no consideration for the commercial use, the retail use, or parking requirements for that. Hmm. It's comparing it to strictly residential projects. Um, I did some research into looking at units um, per acre, just straight residential units per acre. Um, they defined units mostly three bedroom and so that's something that that when we look at the stuff if you have most of the units being five bedroom mm -hmm. that's really that's so you know it, the numbers can be deceiving because per mm -hmm. as a per unit measurement per unit per acre right. um, you're still stuffing a lot more people in there if they're all five bedroom mm -hmm. units I see so. you do have a breakdown for area per bedroom Right. right. I so, should have three columns there. One area per unit, one area per bedroom, one area per resident. Yeah. Because that, that's, yeah. you know, that's an issue, I think, these five-bedroom units. We don't have the um, whatever it is that they're calling the one they're building on Landmark here, do we? In the no. Landmark Palmer Lodge. Place. Palm, 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 Palm Place, mm -hmm. yes. No, do we have Copper Beaches or all the other incarnations that have gone hmm. Well, Copper Beaches is still doesn't have anything. No. no. Uh -oh. If we can. Just floating around. It keeps the reality. If we're lucky, it <laughs> stay that way. Okay. And just so you know, too, um, in doing my research and talking with Mr. Prokos, he had inquired about the density of Palmer Place. And it's, it's over 1250 per mm -hmm. unit, mm -hmm. but I think it's less than 1300. So it's just barely over the threshold where it would have, if it had gone any lower, it would have required a variance. And they would have had to come through planning. Or to zone appeals for that variance. So they were just above it. They didn't need to ask them for a variance for uh, 1250 per unit. Okay. All right. Anything else? The only other thing that I have is I provided to you a copy of uh, a publication called Zoning Practice. It's the most hmm. recent edition. I've, I'm a member of the American Planning Association. It's a publication I subscribe to. It talks about the one I gave is about electronic changeable copy signs. And I'm trying to find all the parts of the uh, planning advisory service, the PAS. Uh, document from the American Planning Association that I earlier provided to you related to electronic changeable copy mm -hmm. signs. It's very thick. I mean, it has things in there that it's amazing that there are so many considerations actually for electronic changeable copy signs, electronic billboards, messaging centers. Um, I mean, there's lots of different terms, descriptions, applications. As soon as I make sure that I have that complete package together, uh, I'll provide each of you Again, if you need that, um, a, a copy of that. Okay. Thank that's, you. That's all I've got. <laughs> Opportunity for citizens to speak Thank about you. items not covered on the agenda. Did you, get on the Did you sign in? Uh, I didn't see yes. the sign oh, yeah. and, you have it, you yes. and you haven't been sworn in? Did you have an extra one? No, but she can have mine for now. Oh. That's all right. You, I'll get them from if you're going to speak, do you swear that whatever you say will be the truth? I do. Okay. okay. <laughs> Greg Rogers, 14 Granville Avenue. Uh, first of all, I was wanted to comment on the fact that this time for the Planning Commission uh, meeting does has a certain disenfranchising effect on the public because it's a very difficult time for people to get away to. I mean, it's in the middle of the day, for God's sakes. So that was the first comment I had. I think that the Planning Commission ought to look at uh, putting the, the meeting in a time frame that provides more accessibility to the public so they can participate in the democratic process in the city. Okay. Second of all, 
the, the I hear this uh, issue is being dealt with, and maybe some people I could ask a question or two. Uh, what is the status of the updated signage ordinance? Because the uh, proliferance of illegal signage in terms of rental properties in the city is is creating a blighting situation, and as people are mobilizing out, that just creates more and more of a of a downturn in, in the neighborhood. So. Um, if so, is there someone in the planning commission that's considering that, and what, how far have you come with it? Because I haven't been able to get a lot of feedback. From it's anybody. on our list with uh, political signs, with LED signs, mm -hmm. and with several other uh, some revisions of the zoning code. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not; it's not on the agenda right now, but. Right. I just it's on the, as a as an interesting. It's on the list. Okay. It's, it's that's good. research. That's all I needed. That's all I really had. Okay. And can I say something about the time? Um, the time that was you know originally at two thirty um, was changed to noon, um, and there is two different um, audiences that the planning commission does deal with. They deal a lot with businesses. Everybody, almost most of the people here today were businesses. Mm -hmm. The idea for a 12 o'clock is that you can, they can come at noon, not break up their whole afternoon. And also we did discuss when we moved the time about um, having the, um, for you know, substantial um, projects and such, um, having all public hearings at, in the evening to encourage public participation. Um, so it's a balancing act to be able to I understand everybody here especially like Steve goes to like six meetings in the evening and Paul and Paul both have a lot of evening meetings and so you have to have a balance with the people who volunteer to do this the business owners that we deal with and the and the public and we thought noon would be good because some people like Chris nicely came down during her lunch hour you know, mm -hmm. that's an available thing as opposed to 230 which was um, the least convenient for Oh, definitely. People. So that's the thought behind there. Mm -hmm. We don't mind if they pack a lunch and, and eat it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I can understand. I can understand. Yeah, take oh, take oh, it in that Lord, light. I just want. I also want to comment that I can I can understand the convenience of, of the of a noon hour uh, meeting time. So that, that's the only questions I have. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Disposition of minutes. Yes. Okay. I move we approve the minutes. And did it did, any... Paul found the part where it did say that since um, was that the Mark, communications? Mark, right? yeah, Mark didn't have a case number, so we weren't really doing anything with it last mm -hmm. week okay. or last meeting. So. Well, I basically I asked if I was, he was coming here for a lot split and curb cuts or both, and he said both. But again, we only have an application for one. Okay. Oh. And a case number. Sorry, I didn't look at his. Um, but he doesn't have an application. Yeah, it is. So, yeah. okay. Okay. Um, do I have a second? A second. Okay. All those in favor? Of approving? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. And uh, do I have a motion for adjournment? Oh. Okay. <laughs> We're there. Okay. We're there. One forty-four. Okay. Do you have something that says?